I want you to open your Bible to the book of 2 Timothy uh, chapter 3. And we're going to read through the chapter. But we're going to start with the 14th verse. And I want you to understand this verse in its context. Because this is what you're going to be dealing with all of your life in the Christian life. Now I've given you the book to read, the biography, you're to read it. <clears throat> I've given you one of my books that you need to use as a guide to teach someone and disciple them. Remember that the Lord has told us in His Word that we're to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. To grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, knowledge may seem to be something we can just keep adding, you know, with facts and academic things. What about the matter of grace? I mean, there's more to knowledge than that, but what about the matter of grace? How do you grow in grace? The Bible says that Jesus Christ was full of grace and truth. Truth and grace. Knowledge. There's a fruitful knowledge of the Lord and there's an unfruitful knowledge of the Lord. I want you to find out what that is. A fruitful knowledge and an unfruitful knowledge. And somewhere you need to put that down so you can try to remember it. Because, for example, the first time I ever went to Israel, I was amazed. I've been there 16 times, but I was amazed that the guide knew more about the Lord than I did. Now, I'm not saying that I'm some sort of scholar. The thing that shocked me is not that he knew more about the Lord than I did, but he knew all these things about the Lord, but he was not a believer. That's what shocked me. But it also helped me to realize that <clears throat> you could memorize lots of things. But never truly know the Lord. Shocking, isn't it? Now I've dealt with this particular point many times. <clears throat> but it is in a sense what summarizes my life, the way I teach what I think about teaching people, and I want you to look at it. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul, of course, is pitting these words to his son in the ministry. And he says in verse 14, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now I want you to get hold of this, would you please? Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. But notice it starts with this sort of disjunctive conjunction here. Um, but. But. In, in, in light of what we're dealing with. Remembering what we're dealing with. Even though what we're dealing with is tough. May I say, don't spend all your time dealing with this. Look just before it. But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. So how do you fight evil? How do you deal with it? Let me give just a little testimony. You know, when you serve the Lord for a while you gain some visibility. And so I have a certain level of it, uh, maybe just from making a lot of people mad. I don't know. <laughs> but, but from talking a lot for many years and knowing lots of people. And you have people who constantly want to tell you things and constantly want to get you involved in things. Um, my wife likes cats. I like cats. That doesn't sound manly. I'm sorry. But anyway, uh, I love my wife and she loves cats. And so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, a secret cat lover, I guess. But, you know, we love cats, dogs, and all of it. But cats, you know, are strange creatures. Pe people have called them little women in fur coats, but I'm not sure if that's accurate. But they're always, they're always filled with just a certain amount of mystery. 
But many times when they're playful, they want to try to engage you. They, they're engaging you. They try to engage you in something. They throw a paw out, try to engage you in something when, they're, when they want to be playful or they're curious or sometimes I think just to aggravate you. And people are a lot like that. They want to engage you. They want to get you into something. They want you to spend your time on something that they're interested in or maybe they're not even interested in. They just want to talk about or be critical of something. Well, we're, we're deeply into this here as you'll see in a moment when we read the entire chapter. But he says evil men and seducers are going to wax worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived. This is their work. And they want to get you engaged in what they're doing. So the verse does not begin, the next verse, and remember this is all together, it doesn't begin just by saying, continue. In light of this, knowing this is going on, but... Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing whom thou hast learned them. In other words, keep yourself on track. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. You're apt to take a detour and stay on it for the rest of your life. I want you to write this down as a quote. I don't know where you are. Some of you, this will be number three. And for some of you, it might be number 30, and some of you might be number 60. The devil is in the business of distracting people. The devil is in the business of distracting people. Just a hint of it, or a glimpse of it. The distraction can lead to engaging in something. How many of you could figure this out easily? Some sinful distraction or some distraction that may not be sinful but could become sinful and you must turn from it. You must turn from it. It's it wants to engage you, but you must turn from it. That's the work Satan majors in. It all is about deception. So, I must live a certain life. I must live a certain life. That's not a boring life. Many people are ever learning, the same chapter says, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Well, we should be learning, but growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to show you this process here. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. <clears throat> and we could stop there as I've said to many of you in the past, and leave out this phrase, and has been assured of. And just read like this. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. In other words, let's skip the whole process of being assured of. Now some people want to teach that way. I want you to pay close attention because you're going to be tempted to do the same thing you hate others doing on you. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, knowing whom thou hast learned them. In other words, just sit still, be quiet, and listen, and learn. Well, there's some things that need that kind of rote instruction. Um, I learned, I learned my ABCs, and before I could do my name in cursive, 
<clears throat> you know, and then even add my own little flair to it, cursively. I had to learn to write C L A R E N C E. That's when I thought it would have been better if they'd named me Bill or something like that, you know. But <laughs> anyway, uh, but there was no other way around it. You just learn your A, B, C, D, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, B, W, X, Y, Z, and you just take your letter. And then I learned <clears throat> to write in cursive. C, L, A, R, put the little thing there, E, open the E, C, <laughs> E, all right, so C L A R E N C E. <clears throat> now, then I learned to do this. <clears throat> And that's the way it went. Now, I don't have a problem in the world with someone saying, look, don't ask questions. Use your motor skills. There's a whole lot to tell from someone's handwriting. Many times the most creative people in the world have very poor handwriting. And uh, uh, my mother was very concerned about my handwriting. My father could not write his name. Now that sounds strange to you, doesn't it? At this stage in my life, I think about how that bothered him. He signed, tried to sign, but I've even seen him make an X and someone else wrote his name. And they just say, put your X here. You, you, you really weren't involved in that kind of thing in your life, I'm sure. But I, I don't have any problem with that. But when we're, when, we're dealing with, when we're dealing with things that are to become a part of your life, not learning experiences like that, um, things that you're going to express as a body of belief, a body of belief, these are things I believe. I heard someone say that and I, I listened and I made that a part of what I believe. When I was at the University of Tennessee, I met a lot of people who just listened to some professor say something and the next thing you know, sure enough, they were repeating the same nonsense. There was no factual you know, evidence for why they should believe that. They were just so admiring the person who said it, they just said, I believe it. And now, critical thinking, the critical thinking, which means not being critical of, of the thinking, but synthesizing the, the thing and, and checking it out with the truth and comparing it and using uh, judgment and discernment. So when you're, dealing with, when you're dealing with what's going to become a part of your life, when you're dealing with what's going to become a part of your life, what you're going to say, this is the body of belief that de describes, defines who I am. That takes work. Now, I want you to listen to the verse again. Continue thou in the things, but continue thou in the things. See the importance of that? Not just continue. But, wait a minute, don't be distracted. Don't get in every cat fight imaginable. Know that it exists, but don't be distracted by it. But, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Now you're convinced. You're convinced. 
You're not going to be shaken from this. You're not going to be moved about, blown about by every wind of doctrine. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them. This is vital. And that little phrase, and has been assured of. That little phrase, and has been assured of. And has been assured of. That's, that's the process you're going through where you make these convictions your own personal convictions. So, if somebody says to you, what do you believe? <clears throat> you say, well, <clears throat> I believe what my daddy believes. Good. But do you? Or are you just repeating what your daddy believes? Is it possible? You'll nod your little heads. I'll hear them rattling again. But is it possible that you can have your own Bible-based convictions that are a part of your life. Is that even possible? Yes or no? Good. So that, uh, that defines who you are, you know. I think, um, uh, for example, integrity, not having any holes. Integrity is a way of life. What are other character traits you'd like to have? I think integrity involves honesty. I find myself sometimes saying things I don't need to say. For instance, I would say, to be completely honest with you, well, what, how ridiculous is that? We shouldn't have to qualify honesty. You're either honest or you're not honest. Um, you know, to can be completely truthful, that's ridiculous. You're either truthful or you're not truthful, right? So what is it you believe? Let me ask you something. Are you a Christian? Are you a Christian? Tell me, are you a Christian? Yes. Why do you say you're a Christian? No, no. Why do you say you're a Christian? Because of a body of beliefs about Christ, the person of Christ, who He is, does He live in you? How do you know He lives in you? How do you know that? How do you know He lives in you? Do you not know that there's a world that's going to challenge you on every, on every claim you make about your Christian faith? They're going to challenge you on every claim. Why isn't the earth millions of years old? Is it? Some people have a gap theory. Bible-believing people have a gap theory. Uh, they believe there's a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 of millions of years. Other people believe, and especially uh, people who understand uh, uh, the ideas that are, that are given by the young earth people, and I have become a young earth people person, and um, the, the appearance of aging because of the universal flood. But if you really want to make that a part of your life, you're going to dig and study and find out why you believe that. Why do you believe God spoke the world into existence? The Bible says He did, but why do you believe it? Is that Do you have enough confidence in God's Word that that's all you need? What do you need to believe it? What will make it truly a part of the fabric of your life? Why do you believe that marriage is permanent? I came from a family where there was divorce. My, my mother and father fought like animals with their fists. And it was awful. Now my father basically just tried to keep my mother from all of that. but It's horrible. But she'd grown up doing that, grown up in that. And... Um, really had a hard time with that. When she became a Christian, she became a Christian 12 years before she died. Um, God changed many of those things in her life. But what, if, what are your convictions? You know? What do you believe about children? Why couldn't you have an abortion? 
Tell me. Explain it to me. Because someone's going to try to talk you into it. They're going to tell you this is a Down syndrome child or this is a child that may have some... They're going to talk you into it. What ought to become a fabric of your life so that you say, wait a minute, that's not who I am and because that's not who I am, that's not something I'm going to do. So, pay attention. Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. You see, I think it's so silly. It's just so silly that we think we can throw a few ideas at people, just throw a few ideas at people, and uh, that, that that's done it. Yeah, they heard it. I said it. That's, that, that's it. Or I think it's so silly that you can take somebody through a series like I'm talking to you, talk, taking someone through in the book I've written on truths every Christian needs to know, and you think they can finish, and, and, and then you give them a certificate that they're a disciple of Jesus. No. You're going to have to learn for yourself and for others, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. You're going to go through that process. Let me ask you a question. Now, you don't have to raise your hand. Please don't embarrass yourself. I don't want you to raise your hand. Am I making that clear? Am I making that clear? Some of you may sit here right now and have thoughts about things that are contrary to the body of belief that you've been handed. Thoughts that are contrary. I'm sitting here after all these years saying to you, after all these years saying to you that I have thought through, been challenged, gone through it, listened to it, every kind of thing from classes on anthropology to zoology to geology, I remember the geology labs and how tough they were on Christians and, and, and watching these multi-million dollar productions by old companies on the earth and God didn't have anything to do with it and, and you know really being challenged and having to think who's right and I'm convinced more than ever solidly believing that the Bible is true. What God says is absolutely true. But even, even me saying it, it helps you. If you regard me a certain way, it helps you. But it still has to become your conviction and has been assured of. And you can get there. Do you have convictions? Let me ask a few questions, okay? What do you believe about God and who He is? Who is He? Who is He? If the Bible says, From everlasting to everlasting thou art God. Self-existing? Depending on no one else? Eternal existence. All-powerful. Omnipotent. Omniscient. Omnipresent. What do you believe? Do you really believe the statement, in the beginning God created and He spoke the world into existence? Do you believe a man was created the finest specimen of mankind who ever lived was the first man, Adam, as God designed and created him. The perfect height, weight, vision, everything before sin, before sin disrupted. What do you believe about it? Do you know, here's what happens to you if you're a thinking person most of the time. You start thinking, how could that be? How could that be? How could someone... And then we start thinking of God as a man. He's not a man. He says he's not a man. 
And then you go all the way around in that journey of faith to say, how could it not be exactly the way God said it? But faith, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That's a description of it, not a definition of it. That's describing it. The definition of it, and it's always active, it's always active, is looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. Looking unto Jesus. That's defining faith. So the writer of Hebrews says, we believe that God is. That's a present tense verb. We believe that God is. We believe that God is. And He is a reward of them that diligently seek Him. So, what defines you? What do you believe? Now, may I tell you a little bit about my journey? It might help you with yours. Would you like to hear? I believe that every person that's ever born knows there is a God. And we begin to hear things about God and who God is. Different people have different ideas about God. I don't think it was an accident that I had believing ants. I'm not talking about little bugs. I'm talking about trying to be funny, great aunts, Aunt Maddie Madison and Aunt Frances or Aunt Fanny, um, they were sisters. And that's just their names. They were devoted people, devoted, absolutely devoted. And one married a right, one married a broadhead. And, um, but they were Harbins, H-A-R-B-I-N-S. And they, they truly knew the Lord. They had great faith in God. Um, they were both born before the turn of the century. My father was born in 1906 to a sister of those two people. And her name was Etta. But um, anyway, so if he was born in 1906, I imagine that his mother was around 20 when he was born. So she, uh, she was probably born in, what, 1884, something like that. And they grew up in that era. And these two aunts were older than her. Their sisters were older sisters than her. Well, they were great believing people. No, no, no uh, anything to listen to growing up except people passing stories and community things. Then radio. I didn't see a television. I was born in 1948, and I didn't see a television until 19, probably 55, something like that. I was seven or eight years old um, before I ever saw a television. It just didn't ex exist where we were. The only thing we listened to was radio from time to time. And that was not easy to get. But we listened to people talk. And I'm trying to help you with something. And they spent time reading the Bible and talking about God and the Bible. Both those aunts were Sunday school teachers. It's no accident that God planned for me to be in that, that home. My father was always gone, and so he, he placed us in that home. His mother and father were, his father was killed, his grandfather was killed. That's the sexton side of the thing. When he was 10 years old, and so from the age of 10 till whenever, um, he, was in, he and his two brothers were in people's homes, and so... The aunts took over for the parents. His mother disappeared. 
I found out she didn't die until about 1960, 66 or 68. And we didn't even know she was alive. She was alive a good part of my youth, you know, almost till I was 20. But they talked about the Lord. They talked about the things of God. And my, my ideas about God came from those older, gray-haired women. My Aunt Fanny never cut her hair. It had never been cut. And uh, she, lived, she lived to be 90-something years old. When I got acquainted with her, uh, she was probably s past 75. And that seems very old to a child, you know. But she would sit at night in a chair with a huge comb that had big wide teeth and pull her hair down over her arm and comb her hair, actually cleaning it and combing her hair, and the whole time talking in front of a fire, talking. And I sat at her foot and listening to her. Well, my ideas about God and, and the things of God came from that. Now, I didn't become a Christian until I was 14 years old. But I shaped an opinion about the Lord. Because everybody knows there's a God. What's He like? What is He like? Now, I want you to take that scene, which, you know, almost seems surreal. It's not, it's not really something you would even think existed today, and I don't think it does, to what people are looking at today with somebody maybe all tattooed up, uh, talking about God, uh, maybe, maybe as, a, as a byword or even as a cuss word. And the bombardment of media and sometimes somebody will do the most absurd things and then say, God bless you. We've seen it, haven't we? So... Where are people getting their ideas about what kind of God or who God is? If they're not getting from the Bible, if they're getting from people who say they know the Lord. So I'm saying to you, we all have a shaped image in our, in our being, in our minds, about what God is like and who God is. The Bible reveals God, just like nature and conscience reveal God, in the natural way, these natural revelations of God in conscience and creation, but there is a word, word for word revelation of God, the verbal revelation of God, every word of it, the plenary revelation of God, verbally plenarily inspired word of God. So God wrote a book about himself. The whole book is about God. It's not about David and Joseph. It's about God working in David's life, Joseph's lives. It's about, and you say, well, it's about the earth opening up. It's about God opening up the earth and why he did it. You see what I mean? Those great stories. So you're, you're learning, you should be learning what you, what you know about God, what you believe about God from God's word. But how many people are really studying the word of God? They should be reading the word of God. They should be. If we're going to help people, we've got to get them to the word of God. So... If the Bible says, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and it's been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, where are people learning things? Where are they? That's why if you keep backing up in this chapter, if you still have it open, it talks about wicked people, wicked things. And then this statement in 14 is followed by 15. And from a child, from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise in salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scriptures give them inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So what, what God is continuing to say there as Paul writes these words to Timothy is, what, you're, what you should be learning and what others should be learning about God and what they believe is, is coming from the Word of God, coming from the Bible. If I ask you right now, here you are in a Bible college, and if I ask you right now, what do you believe? 
about God and the Bible. You would give me all kinds of statements. Um, may I have one copy of that, please? Send someone up here with it, if you don't mind. And so I want you to have this, and I want you to look at it. This is just something I, I wrote. Critical thinking conclusions. God created man to be instructed and to communicate with him. Christian educators are laboring together with God. We believe that God's working while we're working. God is before all things, therefore the nature of truth cannot be separated from God. It is God's desire for us to know Him. Life is worth living because it represents more than mortality. The indwelling Holy Spirit and the eternal Word of God enable us to develop the mind of Christ in our thinking. We must always make the connection between belief and behavior. It's essential that we do not separate teaching from learning. Christian education is not slightly better. It is totally different from secular education. Secular meaning no, no religion, no religious order. It's just as illegal, it's just as illegal for a teacher to get up in school to say there is no God as it is for a teacher to get up in a public school and to say there is God and you should know Him. In other words, it, it, the, the, the law prohibits a teacher from denying the existence of God. But we don't challenge them on that. Christian educators may be used of God in many settings. Christian education provides the only sure foundation for life. Christian education brings us to a new level of expectation. And I try to explain those things in a lecture. Sometimes when I'm gone, if there is a time, this would be a good thing for them to watch. But I want you to have a copy of this. And I want you to think about, you have to form convictions. Where are you going to get them? Let's pay, let's pay close attention just a moment. Let's imagine we take this to any area of your life, maybe a, the boy-girl thing, and the girl says, no, I'm not going to do that. Or the boy says, no, I'm not going to do that. Why? Why? Is it because it's a part of your belief system? What violates that? What breaks that down? You can run emotionally ahead of fact and belief. When God made you, made your spirit, soul, and body. In your spirit, you have a conscience. In your soul, you have intellect, emotion, and will. And the intellect, or what you know to be true, should come before the emotion. You know, you could take some movie, something that can scare the life out of you, but if you stop and think that three feet from that person who's scaring you, there's a camera and people, it's not real. It's a pretending thing to be real then you sort of think, oh, I'm not going to let this tear me up because it's not real. It's just something somebody's making look real. But your emotions can run ahead of, of fact and truth. And you can become so emotionally engaged with the opposite sex, so emotionally engaged in something that you violate what you know as a part of your belief system. So part of that belief system is to try to keep you out of the situation where emotion may take over where good sense should be ruling. You understand what I just said? So building a belief system on the Word of God, but continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. These are my convictions. I didn't just learn them. Knowing of whom thou hast learned them is vital to living the Christian life. 